Well, thank you everyone for joining us for this pre-concert discussion. I'm so excited about two really important works that we're performing coming up here soon. Mozart C minor mass and Jocelyn Hagen's The Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. Lots of great stuff to talk about with these works. And I am thrilled to be joined today by with Chelsea Helm. Hi, Chelsea. Hi there. How you doing? Doing so great, Eric. Thanks for asking. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are you? I right now I am in Miami, Florida. Holy buckets. Which is not where I live. I uh I'm I'm doing a project with Seraphic Fire, a professional choir based here, um, that's directed this week by Elena Sharkova on a program of all works by women composers called In Her Voice. Um cool. and we open that we open that concert series tonight. Wow. So you're in Miami and then you're coming over to Tucson next week and you've probably been all over the place even since the, the beginning of this new year. So what what's it what's it like being on the circuit and just constantly being in the air and going from gig to gig? That, that's got to be just draining. It's it is a weird job. That is to be sure. Um, You you kind of. I, sometimes it feels like, you know, having multiple personalities because I, you know, I, I show up in Miami and I have friends here and colleagues here and work relationships here and my favorite restaurants that I go to. And then I go to Tucson and I have my close friends, you know, that are inside the ensemble, my close friends that live in the community, my favorite restaurants that I go to, my routines, yeah. you know, my my bedroom we love when from one project to the next we get to have you know a relationship and stay with the same host and then we have the same bedroom and and so it's just really interesting um and then I go home to to Washington DC and I have my friends there and work relationships there and my husband is there which we love and and our cute apartment and so there there are elements of it that are draining for sure um there are there are some times where I'm on a plane on Monday, start rehearsals that evening, finish that project on Sunday afternoon. And then the next day, Monday, I'm on a plane to a new location yeah. to repeat the exact same process. So the schedule is extremely demanding. Um, the irony is that it's it's hard, travel's hard on your body and all of those transitions can be hard on your body. And coincidentally, my body is also my instrument. So it, yes. it makes for a, a really challenging lifestyle. Um, but then you get to do things like get up on stage and sing the most glorious, you know, music that you've ever imagined. And, and you're like, oh, OK, yeah, this is this is totally worth it. <laughs> well, uh, so how, how many weeks would you estimate that you're you're away flying and, and, and doing gigs around the country? That's a really good question. Um, this this past season, it was about two or three weeks a month. Um, wow. I usually have a, a period off of about two or three weeks at the end of August, which is kind of when one season ends and the new season begins, yeah. um, the performing season that is. And I usually have about two or three weeks off. I I try very, very hard to protect these two little breaks. I, I try to take about two or three weeks off at the end of the year in, in late December and early January. Um, but aside from that, I'm usually on the road at least three weeks out of the month. Um, wow. And and those can be performing projects around the country, um, or that can be um, a residency visit to the university where I teach voice, which is Southern University, Southern Virginia University over in nice. over in Virginia. Um, uh, so it's it's action packed to be sure. Boy, I'll I'll say so. Um, you're you're flying around and you're just trying to keep <laughs> keep healthy and keep saying and keep track of everything. What's it like having to, you know, as right now you're in Miami and you're preparing and performing these works by women composers, but you get a, you get a big lift coming up next week. And this is happening all the time where you're in the moment performing something, but also having to prepare the next thing. Absolutely. So time management is a skill that has become very essential to my well-being and my continued employment. Um, and and that's time management in so many different ways. Like last night, I, I read through kind of audiated, barely hummed whistled. Actually, I love practicing on a whistle to save voice last night, sang through all my parts in the in the great mass in C minor after okay. having five hours of rehearsal. 
and having um, a dinner with some local friends because that it's it's been really interesting to discover that you can schedule you I can schedule my whole day with all of the things I have to do teach my voice lessons go to my rehearsals um, prepare the next rep. And then I'm totally depleted. So there also needs to be little chunks of, okay, this is time that I'm truly not going to be working, that I'm really going to be conserving energy or, you know, refreshing by going for a walk, moving my body, refreshing by yeah. being with friends, refreshing by having a great meal like that. Well, and then sleep, <laughs> which is a whole other <laughs> lecture, but that those bits are just as important to kind yes. of the ongoing well-being because of just like the marathon uh, pace of this kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Well, I mean, from my perspective, yeah. you are doing a brilliant job in juggling all these things because every time you show up in Tucson, I mean, you, you're raring and ready to go and you know your stuff and you're laying it down. So, so kudos to you for juggling all this. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate that. We appreciate you. So you mentioned Mozart. <clears throat> and uh, this this piece, I just have to say, and I'm interested in your opinion, too. Everybody talks about his Requiem as being, you know, his his most important piece. I, I'd say this to me, this work, this C minor mass is right up there, just right maybe below, but quite possibly could stand right with it. Interestingly, it, like his Requiem, was also left unfinished. Um, we have, you know, his complete Kyrie and Gloria, but only a chunk of the Credo was set. We don't get an unused day, and some parts weren't complete in some of these movements either. But still, it is a masterpiece. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you told me this is going to be your first go with this piece. Is that right? Yes, sir. So I want to hear your opinion about this work. Well, I think it's a masterpiece too. I, I, and this, I will never ever forget the moment that you and I had on the phone where you said, what do you think about the Mozart C minor? <laughs> and I don't even remember what I said, but it probably was at a very high pitch and very, very, very fast. Um, <laughs> I, I just think it's totally marvelous. And I actually fell in love with Mozart through the Requiem. Um, I studied a lot of opera in school and always, always loved and enjoyed his operas. But, but the Requiem was the first piece that I was like, wow, this is, I don't know, this, it tells a story. It's, it, it says what it needs to say. It touches people so significantly. And, and yeah. I've had that experience every time I've been involved with a Requiem that the choir is moved. Even people who are, who are like, hi. I could give or take music of the classical era. There's just, there's something, there's something in it. I just, I love his writing so much. Um, and I think, I think this piece is incredible. I think it's incredibly virtuosic. Um, it, I mean, it reminds me of like abduction from the Seraglio, like yeah. where it's just stratospheric. It's so virtuosic in all voice parts. It, the, the storytelling and the nuance in in the shapes it's so complicated it's there are there are moments that feel like absolute classic Mozart and then there are moments that feel totally unexpected I think it's totally spectacular <laughs> well I'm, get stuff I'm, thinking about it. <laughs> oh well I'm, I'm so glad you feel that way um because I, I just I think it lives in the shadow of the Requiem this work and it it shouldn't be in the shadow I think it should stand right next to it um, you know, there's some interesting backstory to this piece, too. And and why was Mozart composing a mass after he moved to Vienna and he was focused mostly on opera and other things? Uh, you know, there's been conjecture that he he wrote this to sort of assuage his his father, who wasn't exactly thrilled with um, the fact that the Mozart was getting married. Um, and then if this piece and you mentioned the virtuosity of it that Kyrie, but also the Et Incarnatus Est, apparently it was sung by Constanza at, at the premiere of the work in, in Salzburg. She must have been one heck of a singer because I'm dying to hear what you uh, have to say about uh, the technical demands of, of the solo of the pieces in this work. Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that at all. I mean, it's, it's written, it's, the, it's the, probably the most operatic 
concert work that I've ever worked on. Yeah. And it, and it feels narrative in that way too. So it's, I, of, of course it was informed by, uh, by his work, you know, on stage productions and, and yep. character development and storytelling in that way and drama. Lot, lots of drama, but I mean, the range, for example, in the Kyrie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, this is from, you know, the extremes. I mean, how, how's yeah. it going? How's how's it coming? It's going great. It's, it's really interesting because it's, it's kind of, I was going to say it's a singer's dream and I'll, but I'll just speak for myself. It, it, it feels like a dream to work on a piece that you got to have everything ready to go and of course that's how we prepare in voice lessons that's how we prepare in practice um to have all of to have this accessible range and to have it all be balanced and even throughout and and matched in resonance and color but then to actually get to do that not just within the same like concert work but within the same movement or within the same aria is is completely bonkers um so as long as i don't get to anxious about like feeling you know singer we can as singers we can tend to be a little bit neurotic about our health and well-being <laughs> and as long as we don't fall down the rabbit hole of oh I I I had a weird sneeze this morning and what does that mean gotta bless and release that because you you gotta go on faith that all of your preparation you know not just for this work but all of your vocal preparation you know just in the maintenance of your instrument yeah. is in service of moments like these that you need to be able to sing a low A or A flat, whatever it is, and then yeah. high C's in the next bar. Yeah, so, no, no, seriously. It's a it's a massive challenge, but it's it. I mean, it's the thing. It's the thing that kind of like uh stirs that passion that yeah. that drew me to singing, or that drew all, so many of us to this industry. Yeah, that is moments like these, like that make both. I mean both the singers and the audience or the, the performers in the audience in a way feel like kind of on, on the edge, right. Of just like the spectacular, oh, are they, are they going to pull it off? And it's that kind of thrill. And of course it's demanding, but it's so rewarding. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So the Et Incarnatus S we talked about the Kyrie and it's incredible range. I just, I want to talk about the sheer beauty of Et Incarnatus S this piece there's something so transcendent about it and you know composers over the centuries have reserved some of their most special writing for this text this et incarnatus est and he became man, he became man became human because there's some there's a mysterious quality about this how could the divine become you know human and and so we get some extraordinary moments by many composers but this one um there's just something so unique um, about it. And I just, I'd love to get your thoughts on, on Et Incarnatus Est. Well, you you touched on the thing that, I mean, the thing that like gives me chills about, about my job and, and this aria in particular is that there is something spectacular and unimaginable and uh, mysterious about, about the divine being made man. And, yeah. And that is, I always describe um, sort of my, like, my purpose as a, as a singer. I've always felt very, very convicted that my service to art, to others, is as a vessel yeah. for something. Mm -hmm. um, like, it's always felt like it's not really about me. I'm just the conduit for yeah. something, for a message that someone needs to hear or yeah. feel or a moment of transcendence or a sense of hope or a sense of inspiration um, or just a moment of peace and beauty outside of kind of the rigors and turmoils of our existence. Um, yeah. And I think the fact that it is this text set in this way is yeah. kind of like the, the apex of that very thing that yeah. what, the story that I'm telling is in total alignment with just like a sense of a sense of purpose and meaning in singing that yeah. this is something divine, whatever that means for you. This yeah. is something divine through the conduit of my imperfect human self yeah. 
just just trying to pass it on um Mm -hmm. and a lot of people talk about Mozart that way too that he's one of these composers that was just touched by something right you know we talk about geniuses in this way um that it was something unexplainable passing through the pen or the piano or in in this case the voice so so it's very meaningful for me in in that way but I think that speaks to why like why I set this text in this way is is for that reason exactly Oh, beautifully said, Chelsea. It's um, I, I couldn't have said it better. That's I, I love that. This this piece is is full of so many incredible moments. Have you seen Amadeus, by the way? The movie? Oh, a long time ago. We used to watch yeah. that in in choir when our our teacher was out for the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great movie, and and there are, there are a couple moments. There are a few moments actually in the movie that that um, where we, where we get some of this music. It one of the greatest films ever i think this is one of the greatest pieces ever i am so thrilled you're going to be our soprano soloist for this program um it's always a a great pleasure to work with you chelsea and and to speak with you thanks for for taking time uh, to share your thoughts and i guess one more question before uh before i let you go so what, what 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 do you love about tucson especially I the first thing I the first time I was ever in Tucson I it felt like I landed on an alien planet because I'm from the <laughs> upper Midwest and and so I had never and I had been to the desert before and and but I had never really seen anything quite like this and so I think the the thing that actually is my favorite thing is like the color palette is just oh. so for someone especially from the upper Midwest yeah. it's like everything is in watercolor or something where just like even the plants are these like bright like but yeah. washed out kind of like yeah. greens and blues and purples and then you see like a pop of red or yellow and it feels totally stark and yeah. how the entire color palette changes when it rains that's yeah I'm I'm very I'm a very visual person and so that's always the thing that's like oh I'm I'm back in Tucson is like I'm I'm back in sort of this color palette that just makes you oh. feel sort of at peace That's cool. Well, we can't wait to get you back here next week. And um, thanks again, Chelsea. Looking forward to this so much. Thank you, Eric. I am too. Okay, take care. Well, I'm delighted that I'm now joined with our composer, one of our two composers in residence, Jocelyn Hagen. How are you, Jocelyn? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I know you've been really busy. What have you been up to lately? Well, this last weekend, Tim and I went to Wisconsin to perform. Um, We were the headliners for their ACDA state conference. So we got to perform, yeah, as nation, we got to perform to a huge crowd of middle school and high schoolers, as well as some conductors. But I got to say, the high point was when we sang Shallow, and there were high school kids out in the audience. A bunch of them got out their phones and like, oh, that's cool. That was a first. We'd never had that happen before at a nation show. So that was really, really spectacular, memorable. That is really cool. And nation is coming to Tucson. Yes, we are. So come here, nation, on Tuesday, January 30th, 7 p.m. at Hotel Congress. It's going to be great. Super excited to try out that space. It's a really neat Space. It's a really cool space. I think you're going to love it. Our audiences have loved it. It's just, they, they've done a beautiful job in redoing this historical room and it's, it's, it's just got a great vibe and, and looking forward to having you perform there. But first, we could do something very exciting um, with you, Jocelyn, a piece that we performed once before, your notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. And I... I think it would just be great to hear from you again how you came up with this idea, what was the inspiration, and then just it's such a cool story in terms of when where it went from there. Do you mind sharing? Yeah. Well, what's what's really mind-boggling to me now is how long ago the journey started because um the first, you know, little bit of an idea came in 2015, um which is almost 10 years ago already. Yeah, right. Um, so I was approached by the Minnesota Chorale and the Metropolitan Symphony Orchestra here in Minnesota 
they wanted to commission a large scale work from me, uh, which was really exciting. Yes. And yeah, and at the same time, I'd also become aware of this new technology that was created in Minnesota that allows for the syncing of video to live performance. And I really wanted to try out this technology. So um, I, and knowing that it was gonna be something that involved film, um, I reached out you know, to those people, those executive directors, and I said, I think this would be best as a consortium because this is gonna be an expensive endeavor. And they were super happy about that. They thought it was great. And, um, and so they were the lead consortium members of the, of the piece. Um, but I ended up getting, I think, 20 groups um, across the country to sign on to this project, including True Concord. You helped bring it to life. Um, and it was, I came upon the idea of, of Leonardo da Vinci pretty early on because it was almost the 500th anniversary of his death. And that, that was in 2019. So I was kind of looking at anniversaries, you know, what would be big, what also doesn't have a big major work uh, for of choral music written about yet. What, what, um, where are their holes? And, um, yeah. and, you know, there's that one Eric Whitaker piece about Leonardo da Vinci, but right. overall there really hadn't been uh, many pieces uh, about him. So I, I thought it was a great um, a great fit for this piece because not only is there the amazing visual content that I got to choose from, but you know his notebook pages are filled with wonderful words that the singers can sing. So well, uh, tell us about the, about that because you you took a trip and you 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 really dug into this. I did, yeah. About a year or two into the development of the piece, I I said to Tim, I said, I think I have to go to Milan. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Bummer. I think I just have to go check out this museum for myself and talk to this curator slash engineer. And I'm so glad I did. It was a really amazing um, little trip, little retreat that I had. It was less than a week, um, but I was able to find an Airbnb with a piano in it. And okay. so I spent all this time at the museums and talking to um, different people at those museums. And then I'd come back and I would work on the libretto and I actually wrote the second movement practice while I was on retreat in Milan. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this piece, you know, it was four years from the beginning of that idea until it premiered in 2019. And um, yeah, True Concord was one of the very first ones to premiere it that fall. And what's really cool is you took his texts, but you also took some of his sketches and drawings and you set the text to music, your wonderful music, and then you did something incredible with his with his sketches. To tell, tell us about that process. Yeah, well, he, over 5,000 pages of his notebooks remain, which is pretty incredible. And it's also incredible to think that there were probably many, many more that just haven't stood the test of time. Yeah. Um, but you'll see, if you, when you come to the concert, because you should all come to the concert, you'll see you'll see his handwriting and he wrote from right to left as if in a mirror, which yeah. is really cool. Um, uh, so I love that the whole piece starts with, with that. And it's like the beginning of a creative idea. Um, but then, you know, my dad is a dentist and he talked about his anatomical sketches. That's how I knew <laughs> he was, that was what my dad would share with me about, about Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. He, he had all these anatomical sketches because he was, um, he wanted to become a better drawer and a better painter. So he went out and he actually even would kidnap <laughs> cadavers <laughs> and, okay. so, so that he could open them up and study them, see how wow. people were put together. And that was a crime at the time. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. You know, he he cared about his his work that much that he was willing to to break a few laws to 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 satisfy his curiosity. Yeah, it, it 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 is really cool. He was such an inquisitive mind and such a creative genius, and it, it must have been difficult for you to select um, some of those writings, just you know, of, of the many and some of those sketches um, mm -hmm. to come up with this piece that's in nine movements. And um, talk about the process of just narrowing it down. That had to be tough. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. You know, I got really, um, it was really daunting when I started researching because I realized you can see in my library, I think that's the section. Oh, right there. That's my Da Vinci section. Is that the Da Vinci section? Okay. Yep. I, and there were more that I bought and um, have given away now, but I, you know, I started reading all these books and I was like, wow, some of these scholars have devoted their entire lives to studying his work or just a portion of his work. You know, how, how am I going to boil that all down into 30 minutes? And I realized there was no possible way to do that. So I just, I had to pick my favorite things. Yeah. Um, my, my greatest hits. Yeah. So <laughs> that's, well, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And, and what a selection it is. And this piece, I and mean, we were just thrilled to, to be one of the, um, I guess, co-commissioners, uh, if you will, in this process. Um, so I, I have a, a, a strong attachment to this piece, but I'm also very fond of it because not just because it's, we were part of the Genesis and it's such a great piece, but our audience has just loved it. I mean, you were there for our performances back in 2019. Um, and this was a, this was a new venture for us at True Concord. And you call this a, correct me if I'm wrong, a multimedia symphony. Is that, is that the, is that the correct term? Yeah, that's that's what I've been calling it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and you you did it helped us do something new with this. It was it was it was it was new for everybody in our audience, the True Concord audiences, and they just they ate it up. They loved it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I think I think that sentiment is is uh, across the country uh, from audiences that I that I, that I've encountered with this work. Um, it's really beautifully immersive and uh and stimulating and the fact that the the music and the film sync together is a yeah. huge part of that so you know when there's a big swell you know something beautiful happens at that moment it's uh it's just like in the movies you know you know those certain moments when oh yeah. cue the horn it's a triumph yeah, right. right and um it does it uh it means something and it makes it even more um, emotional. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what I really appreciate is that the piece honestly could stand on its own with just the music. Mm -hmm. um, but the combination of the music and the, and the visuals, it's, it's a one, two punch. It's just, it, it, they complement each other so well um, that it, it really does draw the listener in, uh, I think deeper to the experience of, of Da Vinci and, and his, his mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like all the little synapses in the brain just start firing a little differently. Um, yeah. I know that's one of the things that I love about watching dance, you know, because it's still with music, but something about the interaction between the two um, is really special. Now, you mentioned that this work, well, that you had uh, 20 or so um, co-commissioners, and this piece has been performed all over the place, including some really interesting and cool places. Can you tell us about some of the, the highlights of, uh, with this piece and, and its success? Yeah, so it um, just this past summer in August, uh, we took it to Croatia for cool. a couple of performances. That was really fun. So they were both outside, you know, which is something that was on my bucket list with this piece. You know, I wanted to look kind of like a drive-in movie, you know, be able to see it outside. Nice, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so it was done twice in Croatia, beautiful locations. Uh, it also went to Sweden last year. Um, and then I've got uh, a performance scheduled uh, pretty soon in London. Oh, excellent. Month. That's exciting too. Well, too bad for you to have to travel to all of these wonderful places. <laughs> That's a bummer. You know? I know, right? <laughs> but deservedly so, deservedly so. It, it is such an excellent piece. So what can you give us just a little of just a few tips of, or some things that the audience can expect that that maybe they wouldn't have expected with this experience um some some favorite moments or some some um, really poignant places in, in the music yeah you know one movement that always sticks out um with the musicians and audiences alike is actually the third movement called ripples mm -hmm. yeah and um it's just a really beautiful movement and the film actually becomes all images of water, which has this you know, soothing and calming effect. Um, but I also wrote the opening for, um, for women's voices, for sopranos and altos. And so they have this lovely opening in three-part harmony. And it just feels like home to me. 
because I grew up listening to my mom and her two sisters singing oh. in harmony. So every time I hear three-part harmony, it just feels like home. And so that's that's how that the beginning of that movement goes. Um, and then what's also really neat about it is that I sourced a mass from da Vinci's time. Uh, yeah, there's a composer that they, some scholars believe that they might've even known each other, Leonardo da Vinci and Gafurio was his name. And he wrote a mass that was performed and you can perform movements of it today. And I actually just took a few phrases from that mass and incorporated it into the string writing. So it's kind of a mashup. You hear this Renaissance, you know, choral writing in the strings underneath and then the singing over the top, which is really beautiful. Really cool idea. You know, one of my favorite movements is the last one. And <clears throat> I think just because it's it's fun. <laughs> I mean, the whole piece is fun. You, you know, I mean, I, I love the whole piece, but there's something there's some there's some sort of release or something that happens in the in the last movement. Talk talk to us about that. Well, what might surprise everyone is that the the very first decision I made about that last movement was the tempo, mm -hmm. because I knew I wanted it to have this driving rhythm and for it to kind of feel like a heartbeat. And um, so yeah, it has a dun 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 like a yeah. kick drum. Yeah, it, it, and, uh, there's a drum to it. Yeah. Yeah, and so it feels like a pop song and I wanted it to feel that way. And um, and you're right, it's it's upbeat, it's hopeful, it's yeah. um, it's a celebration of creativity and all that we're capable of. Um, and that's what I that's what I really wanted to be the soul of this piece is that look what look what we can do when we really put our minds to it, when we stay curious and we continue to um, you know really think about things at a really deep level you know that's um that's one thing that da vinci was so good at and why he's why people think he is such a genius well that's another aspect of this piece that i really love is you're not just paying homage to this great mind you're you're actually using him as inspiration for all of us we can all dig deep and achieve great things and have creative and and new ideas and and it's it's really an inspiring work from from top to bottom thank you yeah that is that is what i wanted for it to be for us to see a little bit of that inside ourselves it's really cool i well this again i'm i'm so fond of this piece i'm delighted too to um share with folks that we will be recording this piece <clears throat> as part of our next a recording project this uh, later this spring, along with um, Jocelyn's Here I Am. If you were here for Here I Am, you know how incredibly um, marvelous and creative and uh, stunning that work is, also with, um, with the visual element that everybody was so knocked out by. Um, so those two pieces, Here I Am and, and Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, will be part of our next album that we'll be recording. And I can't wait to, to get you out here, Jocelyn, to help us with that and and put this on a record for, for all time for to, to get out there to the wider world. Yeah, thank you. It's It's been, um, you know, it was premiered in 2019 and I've kept it pretty close to the chest. I mean, if you look online, you'll find like little little bits of, um, of the vi video and the music, but it doesn't exist online yet. And so I'm very excited that with, this recording, will finally be able to release it to the world in a bigger way. Absolutely, and it deserves so. Both of these pieces, um, uh, incredible works of, of art by you, Jocelyn, and so we, it's just incumbent upon us to get it out there to, to everybody as many, as many, many people as we can. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, please, all of you, you've got to come hear this. Um, the Notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci, if you heard it the first time, Come hear it again, because you'll hear and experience something new and different. It's just one of those pieces that just not to be missed. And Jocelyn, thank you so much for sharing it with us, sharing your time with us. I'm looking forward to having you out here um, this coming week. And then, of course, to hear you and Tim, our other composer in resonance, in concert as nation on the 30th at the end of this month at Hotel Congress. So again, thanks to everybody for listening and for coming. And Jocelyn, thank you. Thank you. It's a delight to be in Tucson with you. See you soon. Yep. Bye.